Hi, I'm Kevin and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to talk about how to navigate on a canoe trip. So today is a very foggy day and I thought the conditions were perfect for talking about how to find your way. So today we're going to talk about canoe trip navigation. We're going to start with topographic maps, how to read them and how to perceive the environment around you. Then we'll add a compass to the discussion, how to use that compass to give you different levels of accuracy in your navigation. Then I'll share some tips and tricks on how to find portages. And finally, we'll go back to topographic maps and talk about errors that you might find on even a good quality topographic map. Let me walk you through my process. I do bring a GPS, um, but it's turned off. I, I don't rely on that at all. That's uh, if I really get stuck and don't know where I am, I'll turn this on to verify where I am. But I'm a map guy. Here's my map. The, the way I navigate is I track myself on the map the entire time. So once I launch the boat, I'm looking for a marker on the map, maybe some islands, maybe a bay, and I'm going to track myself towards that. So I start with my map and I plan out the route for my trip. Then when I get to the landing, I look at the map and I look at the lake and look for features. In this case, there's a couple small islands and a peninsula that's right along my route. So that's what I'm going to aim for. I'm going to paddle right out to the, those islands and when I get there, I'm going to reevaluate. I'm going to look at my map and I'm going to look ahead. In this case, I'm going to see a peninsula and a channel. And I know my route um, is going to go up through that narrow channel. Then I uh, go around that peninsula and look again. I see a little island to my right. And because I'm tracking all these features, I know I'm right on course. I just came from that direction. I rounded the peninsula on my left. And as I did, I was looking for an island that island right there. Now let's introduce a compass to the discussion. The most basic way to use a compass is to help you find north and orient your map and that will help you uh, read the map and perceive the environment around you. So in this case I was paddling north and then I rounded that peninsula and headed west. So as I was doing that um, I had my compass pointed north, the bezel adjusted for north, and I had my map aligned with my compass. I knew I was paddling north as soon as I went around that peninsula, I switched my map, I rotated the bezel of my compass west, I turned the boat until my compass was aligned west, I'm heading west now. I'm actually looking for a gap. Um, there should be a peninsula on one side and an island on the other. I'm headed right for that gap, it's due west of here. If you're going to use a compass for navigation, make sure that you know how to adjust that compass for magnetic declination. Magnetic declination is kind of a large subject. I don't have time to cover it here, but it just so happens I have another whole video about magnetic declination and how to adjust your compass, and I'll put a link to that video right up here. Now let's talk about how to use a compass with even more accuracy. Before we start using the compass, let's do a quick review of the parts of a compass. We start with the base plate, the direction of travel arrow, the orienting arrow, the magnetic needle, the orienting lines, and the housing or bezel. For more accurate navigation with the compass, we're going to position the compass so that the direction of travel arrow is right over our intended path. Then we're going to turn the bezel until the orienting lines inside the bezel match the UTM lines on the map. If you're going to use the UTM grid on your topographic map to help orient that map, then you're also going to want to take into account something called grid north. The edge of your topographic map is always going to point to true north, but the UTM grid could vary from true north depending on where you are inside the UTM zone. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Those orienting lines inside the bezel of the compass, I'll highlight them in yellow. I match those up so they're parallel with the UTM grid. Now, it's really important to remember the UTM grid doesn't usually point true north. The edge of a topographic map always points to true north, but the UTM grid usually differs. You could use the edge of the map, but the UTM grid is a lot handier because the lines run right across the whole map and you're not always traveling near the edge of the map. You very likely have a diagram like this somewhere on your map that shows the relative positions of true north, magnetic north, and grid north. In fact, there's four different versions of that. For best accuracy, you want to understand this diagram and know how far away grid north is from true north. You can adjust your bezel uh, slightly to accommodate for this if you're looking for top-notch accuracy. Usually, only a minor adjustment is required. 
If you don't know about the UTM grid and Grid North, you are in luck because I also have a video on that subject and I'll put a link to that video right here. Now our compass is all lined up with our map. Our direction of travel arrow is pointing in the direction we want to go and the orienting lines are aligned. They're parallel with the UTM grid. And so now what we're going to do is rotate the map and the compass until the magnetic arrow is inside the orienting arrow often referred to as red in the shed. I'm headed right for that gap. It's due west of here. Uh, the island is camouflaged a little bit because there's a peninsula behind it. So that right there is the gap I'm headed for and the island on the side. Oftentimes while you're on a lake, a feature that you're looking for can be obscured by its background. Here we see the peninsula and the gap clearly and there's an island there but it doesn't really look like an island from this distance. There's a peninsula behind it and they're kind of blending in together. I'm only a kilometer away from this feature and at this distance it's really tough to identify the island. Even at a much closer distance the island is still quite obscured. I'm at only a couple hundred meters away and it's still a bit tricky to pick out the island apart from the peninsula that's behind it. So now I'm approaching that island. It's much uh, closer than it was before. And uh, as I'm traveling, the other thing I'm doing is I'm checking out my map and I'm making sure that all the other features as I'm moving check out. So there's a bay over here, it goes in and around. Um, yeah, that checks out. The peninsula is kind of sharp this way, that checks out. Somewhere along here, there's a channel uh, going back. Um, and I think that's right there. As I move forward, I'll confirm that. So um, I'm always checking out the lay of the land around me, confirming it with the map, and that just gives me extra confidence of, of where I am. The only time I, I lose track of uh, where I am is when I'm on a big body of water. I'm crossing down the middle. That's when I'll use my compass, I'll line things up. I will get a really good bearing of the direction I'm headed in and I will look as far ahead as I can, um, hopefully find a tree or something that, that's a good marker. I'll paddle to that, or I'll just put my compass down and uh, try and keep the boat headed on the right bearing. Now let's talk about a scenario where you might wanna cross a large lake that has very few landmarks and features. This lake is called Clearwater West. It's a lake I traversed a few years ago while on a canoe trip. And here's the scenario. My canoe is in the top northeast corner of the lake and I'm trying to get to the southwest corner where my truck is. So this is a simple scenario of trying to get from point A to point B. And this lake isn't huge, but it is two and a half kilometers across the middle at its narrowest. And my paddle distance is going to be about 6.2 kilometers. At these distances, it's going to be really tricky to identify features on the lake, and this lake doesn't have a whole lot of features to begin with. On the map, you'll notice these two islands, and you might want to use those as features, but uh, at that distance, those features are going to really blend in. So you could uh, still use those islands strategically. You could decide to paddle down the north shore of the lake until you get close enough to perceive the islands, and then you could adjust your route from there. But I'd rather just use my compass and paddle straight to my truck and avoid a few extra kilometers. I'm going to put my compass down on the map with the base plate facing the direction I want to travel. Then I'm going to adjust the bezel to true north. Then we'll turn the map and the compass at the same time until the magnetic arrow is inside the orienting arrow, or red in the shed. Then all I have to do is travel in the direction of the compass and I'll be able to traverse right across that lake in a nice efficient way arriving at my vehicle. And navigation can sometimes be tricky if the lake you're traveling on has an overabundance of landmarks and features. One of the few times I've been confused while traveling on a canoe trip was when I started mistaking one landmark for another. Here's an example of where this could happen. This is Minis Lake, a lake I traveled to this summer. It is absolutely full of islands and features that could cause a traveler to get confused. Once you mix up one landmark, you might start assuming that the next feature you see is a different feature on the map and that can lead to a whole lot of confusion. So it's really good practice to check every feature as you're traveling. Just sort of cross-reference what you see on the map with the landscape and make sure everything checks out. You might not have been following a bearing with your compass. You don't always have to, but if you do get confused, stop, pull out the compass, orient that map and take a good look around. 
If necessary, turn on your GPS. Sometimes finding portages can also be a bit of a challenge. Often in well-used parks or other areas, finding a portage isn't a problem as they're usually well marked. You might even find some structure or a boat cache. But as you go further north into more remote areas, portages can be a little more difficult to spot. Often you're looking for something simple like a blaze, a bit of flagging tape, or sometimes a small stack of rocks. Be aware that blazes on trees get old and sometimes need a little refreshing, or they can be burnt by a forest fire and be a little more challenging to see. In my opinion, there really are two types of portages. Most portages follow rivers or streams. And if you're looking for one of those from a lake, uh, look for a V-shape to your horizon. That's where that portage will be. Other portages that go over a height of land, well, those are gonna be harder to find, but fortunately, they're more rare. Sometimes the accuracy of a portage as drawn on a map is not as accurate as we'd like it to be. And this caused me some grief many years ago uh, when I started canoe tripping. I was in a U-shaped bay and the map indicated that the portage was in the uh, southeast corner of that bay. And I looked and looked and looked. I was fixated on it. I overbelieved the the accuracy of the map. And uh, I spent 20, 30 minutes looking for a portage that wasn't there. Once I realized something had to be wrong, I backed up and looked at the whole bay. And only 40 or 50 meters away in the other corner of the bay was the portage. The most recent map of the same area has much better accuracy. And a very similar thing can happen in streams or rivers. Nobody likes to carry gear very far. And you'll find that most portages begin and end very close to the beginning or end of the rapid or obstruction that you're trying to go around. And so sometimes, um, and I've, I've made this mistake, sometimes you'll paddle too far downstream and have to back up to look for that portage. I cannot find a portage. I'm gonna back up and look some more. Um, there might be one that's wider around this way. My best advice when you can't find a portage is to stop, slow down, back up, and take a broader look around you looking for that portage. One tip I have is if you can't find the portage, Pick a direction left or right and go looking for that portage. Be very thorough and go farther than you have to. That way you won't be zigzagging back and forth. Is it here? Is it there? You'll explore one area very thoroughly. And then if you don't find the portage, you'll be more certain that it's in the other direction. Might save you a bit of time. Now let's talk about inaccuracies and outright errors that you might find on a topographic map. It's really important to remember that maps are just a representation of reality and they're made by humans. And so there's a chance that there's an error in your map. So the best example I have of this, an, a true error on a topographic map is from my twenties when I was doing some field work on Pekanjikum Lake. I was driving a motorboat. We had a crew in the boat and I was navigating and I was very proud of myself that I was checking all the landmarks around me as we were driving. And I spotted an island that was not on the map and I said to the crew hey that island's not on the map of course we stopped the boat and had a discussion about it because everyone lost confidence instantly but uh, it checked out that island and in fact three islands are not on the topographic map of Pekanjikum Lake here's a side-by-side -side comparison of some satellite imagery with the topographic map of the area and if you look closely you'll spot those three islands that are missing from the topographic map I'll draw them where they should appear on the topographic map. Now, true errors like that are pretty rare, but a lot of inaccuracies can be found because of changing water levels with season and weather. Here's a really cool feature that I found in a recent trip on the St. Raphael River. Um, it's really distinctive, but you're not going to find it on the topographic map or on Google Earth because when the photos were taken and the maps were made, the water level was just a lot higher. This is where the feature should be on Google Earth. You do see a small island there. And this is where it should be on the topographic map. It's missing completely from the topographic map. The same thing can be true for rapids in a river. I've traveled over many rapids during high water that I didn't notice at all. Uh, they just disappeared. Likewise, in a drought condition, you may be walking your boat down that rapid. I can't remember if this is the exact spot or not, but uh, on a trip many years ago while paddling the Throat River, I had that experience. We paddled over rapids that were well marked on the map, just like this, and they simply were not there. Okay, that's all the tips and tricks that I have for canoe trip navigation. If you think of something that I've missed, please put it in the comments down below. I hope you liked this video. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, please hit like, share, and subscribe. As always, I will see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.